In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, Diocese of Texas. I'm Gretchen Reberg, I'm Bishop of the Diocese of Spokane, which is all of Eastern Washington and North Idaho, and I bring greetings from the good people of Eastern Washington and North Idaho and say thank you to all of you for welcoming me here. It's been a great day so far. Jesus said, I appointed you to go bear fruit, fruit that will last. Bear fruit. Bear good fruit, a common image for those of us who follow Jesus. And I was reflecting on this image of good fruit the other day as I was washing dishes in my house, looking out the front window, and at the bottom of my driveway, right there in my sight, are my two cherry trees. I have a Bing and a Rainier. And every June, it's a fight between the squirrels and the robins and myself for who will get the most? I lose every year. Hmm? Bings and Rainiers are great eating cherries. I typically will eat a whole bunch as I pick the bucket and take them in the house. And I love having a Bing and Rainier because growing up, we didn't have a Bing and Rainier on the farm. We had instead a sour cherry tree. And they're okay for eating fresh, but not like a bing. But they make great pies. Sour cherry pie. I'll take a sour cherry pie over any pie any day. Now another cherry tree we had on the farm growing up was a choke cherry tree. I think you might have choke cherries down here in Texas. They taste terrible. <laughs> they're called choke cherries for a reason. And only my mother would call them fruit. But she did, and she insisted Dad plant them, and, and we would have to harvest them. But interestingly enough, if you take choke cherries, and you take out the pit, and you boil them up, and all that stuff, they make really good syrup, really good jellies. So beans and rainiers for eating fresh, sours for pie, chokes for syrups and jellies, all of that I thought about while I was washing dishes. And as I continued to wash dishes, a question came into my head. Who determines what is good? Who determines what is good? You see, if Jesus told us to bear fruit, and I take it as an axiom that we're actually called to bear good fruit, then how do we know if it's good? Who gets to make that call? Now, some would say this is obvious, right? There are lists of fruits of the Spirit in Scripture. That's what Jesus was talking about. Of course, it was Paul that gave us that list. And then even with that list, fruits such as love, joy, peace, gentleness, self-control, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, how can you tell? By our fruits, we are known, but what are we doing with the fruit? Are we eating it or making jelly? I am probably pushing this metaphor way too far. <laughs> but it is an important question, for there are many people who know exactly what a Christian is supposed to do. And they base this on their reading of scripture. And what they come up with for their good fruit is a very different picture than what I come up with. And it cannot simply be what anyone thinks is good well, I like beings, you like chokes, all good. I think if we're called to bear fruit, we have to have a way of asking, are we bearing good fruit? And how can we tell? So last week, I happened to see a poster on social media for an event advertised in one of the towns in my diocese. And the organizer said the purpose of that event was to gather the community to discuss how we could make things better in that town. The poster included an outline of the state of Idaho with a swastika. 
and the words, keep Idaho white. Who determines what is good? Every week in the summer, I drive to our church camp, going through beautiful farmland and into the mountains and down to the lake. And as I get closer and closer to our camp, I pass by a fenced, gated, marked militia compound. There's a church, a church in a town close to where I grew up on the farm, in my diocese, that has written instructions, written instructions for how wives are at all times to submit to their husbands in everything, no matter what. And Vladimir Putin has said that, among other things, part of his call is to be the defender of Christianity with Moscow as the new Rome. And who determines what is good? And I share these because when I think about bearing fruit that will last, every group I mentioned calls themselves Christians. They say they are followers of Jesus. And I struggle mightily to not dismiss them as godless heretics. I struggle mightily to love them, or at the very least, to pray for them. And I'm well aware that the history of the church is not as clean a history of good fruit as I would like. And I'm reminded I need to be careful about throwing stones. See, I don't think when Jesus told us, go bear fruit, he meant fill your knaves with people, give lots and lots of money for outreach projects, and then go and make sure the town's homeless shelter is not in my backyard. I don't think Jesus meant serve on the vestry one day and on the town council the next day the votes to forbid giving food to people on the street. And I don't think Jesus meant make the altar beautiful for worship and then go write hateful things on Facebook. Bearing fruit cannot just be about what we do on Sunday or at a diocesan council. It must be what we do every day of the week in every place we are. I don't think good fruit means denying women positions of authority or being part of a militia group or saying you can't get married if you're of the same gender relationship or that if you're trans, you have to be reported. Now, good fruit cannot be anything that denies the presence of God in every person. So who determines what is good? Well, you and I are followers of Jesus. So if we really want to know what it looks like to bear fruit, we need to look to Jesus. If we really want to know what it means to bear fruit, we need to hear the words of Jesus again, love one another as I have loved you. Now, usually when we think about the love command, we think about it in terms of the great commandment. Love God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind, your neighbors, yourself. I prefer that one, right? It's way easier to love others as I love myself because sometimes I don't really like myself, so I can get off with not liking them, too. Right? <clears throat> but, ah, but loving as Jesus loves... Well, who determines what is good? What is good fruit? The one who told us to bear fruit. We are called to love as Jesus loved, to forgive as Jesus forgave, to teach as he taught, to heal as he healed, to serve as he washed feet. We are called to bear the fruit that Jesus bore. For if we want to know what bearing good fruit looks like, looking at Jesus is the best thing we can do. Look to his example, his love, his forgiveness, his kindness, his self-control. If we really want to see the fruits of the Spirit in action, just look to Jesus. And when we look to Jesus, what do we see? We see embodied love. We see God fully incarnate in the beauty of a human being. Now, it's a probably a surprise to some people, but our presiding bishop was actually not the first person to say it's all about love. <laughs> so. 
the epistles, John wrote, God is love. As far as I know, that's the first time in all of human history that that was written down, God is love. And how did John come to that conclusion? How does he come to make such a definitive statement that God is love? It certainly could not have been looking at the history of the human race. I don't see how you could do that and come to the conclusion that God is love. It seems to me looking at human history, what you see is a lot of war and killing. And I don't think Mother Nature teaches us that God is love. You can look at nature and see wonder and beauty and mystery and symmetry. You can conclude that the creator of the universe understands beauty and artistry. But I don't think you could say the fundamental nature characteristic of God is love. I think the only way John could have said that is by looking at the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Only by looking at love embodied in Jesus, the love that Jesus had for everyone, for the leper, for the Samaritan woman, for the Roman centurion, for his disciples, for the Pharisees, even the chief priests, for the love he had for everyone, even on the cross. I think John looked at that and said, this is embodied love. And as John came to understand that Jesus was not just human but divine, he came to realize that God is love. Now, interestingly enough, in Scripture, God doesn't tell us to grow in intelligence. He doesn't say get smarter. If the core of the universe were intelligence, God would say get smarter. And I, I kind of wish he would. She would. But God doesn't say that. And if the fundamental nature of God were power, and God would be all energy and power, and God would say, become more powerful. God doesn't say that. No, but because the core essence of God is love, we're told to love. And Jesus reflects love perfected. And Jesus calls us to follow his example, to grow into the full stature of God, to become the one we are created to be, to learn how to embody love. And our goal in life is to grow in love. Not strength, not wealth, not popularity, not possessions, not fame, but love. The love that says there are no enemies. The love that does good to those who hate you, that blesses those who curse you, that prays for those who persecute you. The love that's not about being a passive doormat. The love that's not about niceness. It does not accept abuse. It does not tolerate white supremacy. It does not say that wars are acceptable. But it actively, actively works. It actively works to bring about more fully present in this world, the kingdom of heaven. It is a love that challenges the powers of this world, a love that heals the brokenhearted, proclaims forgiveness, and embraces all. And it's not easy to do that. Actually, let me speak just for myself. It's not easy for me to love everyone. It is not easy to bless those who curse me. It is not easy to do good to those who abuse me. And these past two years have been really hard. It's led to increased division. I know that in my diocese, people are really tired. They are weary. And at the same time, they are trying to live into the hope and love that is God's call. And what we have learned even more over these past two years is that we cannot love as Jesus loved if we try to do this alone. But you know, we never have to. We are never called to love just by ourselves. We are always and forever called into a community of faith that expresses the love that is the divine trinity, the love that is never alone, always united. The spirit of God was given to us at baptism and dwells within us. And when I am weak, the spirit is strong. We take the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist, and Christ 
is inside us in a real and physical way. We, we can never be separated from Christ, ever. And so when my love is dim, Christ's is bright. And so even in the midst of division and pandemic and war, we have the power to love, the power to heal, to proclaim forgiveness, to embrace all. For it is not our power. It is the power of God working within us. And at times, this might all seem like a fairy tale daydream, an idea that we can call, claim the power of God to, to love and heal and proclaim forgiveness and embrace all. It might seem like it's a simple story told to children with not something that belongs to adults in the real world. And yet we can see examples of love in action wherever we are. So there was a church in my diocese that was being painted. And the painter was working away, getting paid well for it, and professional painter. And one day he went to the priest and he said, you know, I know there are people hungry in this town and I don't have a lot of money, but I can cook. Would you be interested in partnering with me to start a supper? And that church had been thinking about it anyway, so they said, sure. And they started having a supper on Saturday nights. And other churches saw what was happening. And now, in that town, every single night, every single day, every single week, you can find a place to eat. Because one person said, I see a need. And that rippled out. And the interesting thing is that man no longer lives in that town, and most people don't know his name. And it doesn't matter. Because... Active love made a difference. I know of a first grade teacher who was teaching and realized that one of her first graders was homeless. And she said, how could this be? And she started asking questions, and then she got very active in the foster program. And as she started learning more about foster care and fostering kids, others started learning more. And more and more people volunteered to be foster parents. And now several of those folks who are not foster parents but connected are signing up to become child advocates in the foster care system. Because somebody saw a need and acted in love. One of my congregations, there's an 11-year-old girl who got really frustrated because she used to go and help with Second Harvest. I don't know if you have Second Harvest in Texas, probably. It's a place of doing food. She got upset because she was no longer able to volunteer. And so she started doing food drives from her own house. And she put something out over her social media, right? And her, all of her classmates started doing food drives from their own house. And they ended up collecting even more. Acts of love with ripple effects out. You have your own examples. Stories of active love, stories that ripple out. And I'm sure every person here could tell those, their examples, share those stories. And that is a good thing. But of course, often we don't, right? Often we don't share those stories. We're just quietly going about our business, doing the works of active love. And let me suggest that in today's world, we need to do more than that. We need to be willing to be witnesses to Jesus Christ in ways that include words. We need to be able to say, for instance, I help at the food pantry or the homeless shelter, or I give socks or whatever it is, because I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And when I see someone in need, how can I not respond? I do the work I do because I am trying to love as Jesus loved. I do this work. I go to worship. I vote. I help. Because I am called to love as Jesus loved. In every way of my life, I am trying to love as Jesus loved. Now, what would it look like if all the Episcopalians were a little more open about why we follow Jesus? How our actions are because we're trying to follow Jesus. Not in an obnoxious way, of course. But a way that just says it out loud. To bear fruit that will last is to bear fruit that drops seeds and makes more fruit. 
And many times we have no idea what we are doing when we are working, what, who will see it, what will be the ripple effects. And yet we can be sure that when we engage in active love, when we're able to say why we follow Jesus, new fruit will grow. And so we come here this evening at the start of the Diocese of Texas Council, where you will gather for the business of the work of the church. And by the way, I would say that the business started tonight. This is the primary business of the church. I just say that. And when we hear that we are to bear fruit, to love as Jesus loved, to keep his commandments, we hear Jesus call us friends. And we hear these lessons are appointed for the Feast of St. Matthias. And if you're anything like me, you might wonder, what does Matthias have to do with these lessons? So it might be good to remember, we know virtually nothing about Matthias. Right? I mean, yeah, we know that he was one of the ones who followed Jesus from the beginning, that he was drawn by Lot to replace Judas. So he was presumably somebody who Jesus called friend and told to go bear good fruit. There are some pious legends about him. But on the whole, much of his life is lost to us. And so too will it be for us. Most of us will be forgotten by history. Or if we are remembered at all, it'll be one line in some obscure document. And you know, that is okay. It is not fame we are called to seek. It is not glory that we strive for. It is simply to be faithful to the call of Jesus, to love as Jesus loved, and to bear fruit that will last. For when we love as Jesus did, when we manifest the fruits of the Spirit, when we press on to the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus, we will indeed bear good fruit, fruit that will last, fruit that might have different calls and purposes and be shown in different ways, but fruit that will help transform this hurting world. So Diocese of Texas, bear good fruit. Love as Jesus loves. Abide in his love. Do not worry about fame or glory. And your joy will be complete. Amen.